good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, ECS and CIB. Thank you for organizing this very timely event, Dr. Abd Latif, Mr. Mohanna, Mr. Sultan, and my mentor, uh, Dr. Omar Larini, one of the legends of climate finance globally. Um, excellencies, ambassadors, uh, dear friends, everyone online. Um, speaking on behalf of the COP27 incoming presidency, um, we could go on and on to explain exactly what our vision is, so I'll try to make this concise and to the point. Um, from the moment we assumed this responsibility in preparation for COP27 here in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, we made it abundantly clear to everyone that the objective is implementation now. After the global community having negotiated for many years, most recently, relatively speaking, in Paris in uh, 2015, concluding the Paris Agreement. We spent six full years negotiating the Paris Agreement work program, which is to implement the Paris Agreement. Um, so now we've concluded that, so to speak, in Glasgow, and now it is time to implement. That is the expectation, that is what public opinion expects, and the urgency of the climate challenge. It is the existential challenge of this generation. We are a species that is uh, threatening itself of extinction. We literally need to get acting now. So with that in mind, we focus, of course, you have two sides. You have the multilateral intergovernmental side, which is the negotiations. They will continue, of course. There are many issues to be negotiated in Sharm el-Sheikh, and I'll touch upon a few of them. But there is an action agenda that the Egyptian presidency is putting in place to ensure that we combine both the negotiating aspect, which is the legal framework that governs states in their behavior and actions. But on the other hand, we have to involve each and every single stakeholder. When we say stakeholders, it of course includes the business community, it includes philanthropies, it includes civil society organizations, gender, indigenous people, cities, states, municipalities, you name it, everyone has a role because this is a transformative moment. We have all as humanity followed an unsustainable development model since the Industrial Revolution, and now we've come to the realization that this cannot continue and we must shift to a sustainable environmental and uh, economic development model. So with this in mind, I'll very briefly touch on some of the issues for those of you who are interested in the legal framework that governs governments, which is the intergovernmental aspect. We have a number of issues that have to be completed because we are lagging behind. Science through the IPCC and other scientific reports tell us that we have gaps across the board. We have a mitigation gap, we have an adaptation gap, and we have a finance glaring shameful gap. Those are the main aspects. And then there's the issue of loss and damage, for those of you, again, versed in the process, which is the immediate damage, what you saw in the Pakistan with 33 million displaced, internally displaced people, and billions of dollars, 30, 40 billion dollars of damage to their infrastructure and other. That is loss and damage, and there has to be a way to help people financially deal with the immediate losses and damages of these extreme weather events, for which, incidentally, they are not responsible. But that's an issue of equity, and I'll maybe touch upon it moving forward. And then you have the issue of mitigation. We're lagging way behind if we are going to have any hope in keeping the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement alive. It's the two degree and well below two degrees rise over the industrial level, uh, pre-industrial level temperatures. Every suffering that we're witnessing, every suffering that you're seeing today is the consequence of 1.1 degrees of rise. So you can just imagine what a business as usual scenario would lead to moving forward. So we need to keep 1.5 alive. That's the mitigation side and there's a negotiation going on and we have a responsibility as Egyptian COP presidency to deliver on a mandate that's called the mitigation work program. Adaptation is the flip side. That's the locked in consequences and impacts of climate change that the whole world particularly in vulnerable communities, has to contend with. So, rise of sea level, uh, change in rain patterns, water scarcity, food uh, scarcity, all of those issues that communities have to adapt to. There's something called the Global Goal on Adaptation. This is a two-year mandate coming from Glasgow. We need to complete it by uh, Dubai next year. So we're doing our part, making sure that it moves forward. Finance. It is distressing, and uh, I'm sure you'll hear a little bit about it, much more about it from Dr. Arini later. but. The global climate finance uh, landscape is, uh, leaves much to be desired, and I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible here. Um, there's been this uh, fictitious target of $100 billion that's supposed to be delivered since Copenhagen 2009. It has never been uh, delivered, that promise. So uh, $100 billion is, is a drop in an ocean of needs. It is detached from the actual needs that exist that are in the trillions, yet it hasn't ever been delivered. 
Um, whatever climate finance is out there is a combination of public money and private money. And the total figure, I think, last time I checked, was about $638 billion. Uh, most of that uh, goes to developed countries, incidentally. Uh, a lot of it, most 61% of it, is in the form of uh, loans, so it's normal debt. Uh, only 6% is in the form of grants. And uh, you can look up many details about the climate finance landscape, but I'm just trying to demonstrate that there is a tremendous gap. And without finance as the catalyst, very little can be done, both on the mitigation side and on the adaptation side. Incidentally, last point on finance, emission reduction is the core of the process. We have to avert future damage to our planet, uh, but it's not the only part. But it gets maybe 90% of climate finance, whereas the adaptation needs, again, incidentally, in the most vulnerable communities, gets a very, very small fraction of that. That's why there's a target, at least in public money, that came out of uh, Glasgow that we try to double, uh, developed countries will try to double by 2025 compared to 2019. So whatever figures they were providing for adaptation in 2019 should hopefully be doubled by 2025. Again, it's a, it's a valiant effort. We appreciate that, but it is far short from what the actual needs are. So that's the negotiating side, and, and that's the realm of uh, government representatives who have to, I don't want to say fight it out, but they have to discuss and find the middle ground. And it's our role as Egypt to finesse this process to ensure that people find the appropriate landing zones in the middle ground that will allow us to make progress, because it is expected that we make progress on all of these issues. Mitigation, adaptation, finance, and loss and damage. Again, there are many other issues, but I'm highlighting the main ones. But as many of you are aware, COPs have evolved over the years from just being this intergovernmental process where legal texts are discussed to a, a much, much bigger event. It's an annual event where all stakeholders become involved. And Egypt, as, as host of this incoming COP, has made it the implementation COP and, and have labeled it as the implementation COP. It wouldn't be logical not to include every and each uh, one of the stakeholders that can come to mind. Because every economic sector is impacted and every economic sector will have to shift to a more sustainable model. That includes the energy sector, the oil and gas sector, um, uh, housing, transportation, agriculture, you name it, there will have to be a shift in your processes to ensure that you're sustainable and uh, regulations in place in many countries and gradually moving from country to the other, you'll see it will make it uh, much more difficult to continue business as usual. There will be expectations of every sector to come on board and to ra raise their game to the level of sustainability that we're all aspiring to. So to that effect, Again, as presidency, we've uh, put in place what is now known as an action agenda. That's separate completely from the negotiation process. The action agenda, in our case, I can sort of split it into three sections. You have initiatives. Uh, host countries uh, launch their own initiatives and welcome initiatives coming from others. For example, in Glasgow, one of there were several, of course, initiatives coming out, uh, but uh, you had the race to net zero, the GFANS, you had the uh, methane pledge. Uh, we're having a number of initiatives. There's a water dedicated initiative, there's a uh, waste initiative, there's an uh, agriculture, food and agriculture initiative, there's a decent life, uh, the Egypt decent life, Haya Karima initiative is now being scaled up for Africa and being presented at COP and it's gaining a lot of traction, a lot of interest in that. And then there are other uh, emissions related initiatives that we're working on as well that are all being launched uh, uh, day after day. That's the initiatives, and there are other initiatives that are coming from other countries that we're receiving, and we will give them the, the platform and, and, the, and the ability and the visibility to be uh, propagated and hopefully supported by others. Uh, and then you have thematic days. As many of you have participated in COPS will be aware, there's always literally hundreds, I dare say a few thousand side events. So sort of to make things a little bit more uh, understandable for people, we've clustered them into thematic days. So you have a finance day that's led by our Ministry of Finance, Dr. Maid. It has about 10, 12 sessions on that day. Uh, and that covers the whole gamut of uh, finance, uh, climate finance related issues. You have a gender day, a youth uh, and future generations day, a water day, biodiversity, uh, decarbonization, energy. Uh, there's, uh, I think, 11 uh, thematic days. And those are, of course, uh, tremendous opportunities because you have high level speakers from around the world addressing every aspect under the theme of the day. So uh, those are basically uh, the two components of the action agenda that exists. 
in uh, Egypt, uh, the Egyptian presidency's vision. The last part, which is again very important, is uh, the heads of state uh, summit that is held on the 7th and 8th. And this is again a practice, it is not compulsory, it's up to every host country uh, to decide whether they want to have a, a heads of state section or not. Um, in our case, that's what we've chosen, so on the 7th and 8th we will have uh, a heads of state uh, summit. We've received a large number of uh, confirmations from heads of state from around the world. I think uh, last count it was about 90 heads of state, but the number keep, uh, numbers keep coming in. Uh, essentially, what we've decided is that our uh, heads of state uh, section of the uh, COP will not be a traditional plenary only type uh, uh, affair, but rather there will be six round tables, three on day one and three on day two, parallel round tables uh, for heads of state to actually engage in a discussion uh, on the issue at hand. Uh, so we're covering green hydrogen because that's a, the emerging a new energy source that a lot of people are excited about. But there's a water security, a food security, a just energy transition, um, vulnerable, vulnerable communities and how to assist them. Uh, each one of them will hopefully be head, essentially that's the plan, by two heads of state and, and other heads of state will have chosen which roundtables they want to participate in. And uh, our hope is that this will be a dynamic exchange of views between heads of state at that level. Uh, what this does effectively is it creates the political momentum needed for these uh, affairs. You can't ha just have technical negotiators sitting in rooms fighting it out. Uh, I think the direction coming from heads of state is always very important. The UK did that. In Paris there were heads of state and, and other cops as well. And we strongly believe that we need all the political will and political momentum and direction coming from heads of state to push the process forward because it has become uh, a very, very adversarial process. And this is another point that Egypt has been stressing. We cannot continue on this trajectory where everything is adversarial, where everything is zero sum. This process is a very, uh, very dependent on buy-in by everyone. Everyone has to feel that their interests are taken on board. No one can feel left behind. No one, I mean, no country or community can feel that their priorities are being neglected or left behind because we, our success collectively as, as humanity depends uh, tremendously on buy-in by everyone and everyone feeling that they're going to be making a, a fair contribution. Lastly, there's an issue uh, that we as a developing country have to stress all of the time. It is equity. There's a principle within this process that's called CBDR, common but differentiated responsibilities. We acknowledge that everyone knows, of course, that since the Industrial Revolution, late 1700s, moving forward, uh, the realm of, of global uh, CO2 emissions was exclusive to very few countries, mostly in Europe. The United States even became an emitter later, uh, maybe half a, uh, half a century later, uh, an effective uh, emissions uh, contributor. But essentially, most of the industrialized world was responsible for uh, where we are right now. So there is an acknowledgement, there always has been in this process an acknowledgement that there are countries who have an added responsibility, which are today's developed countries. But we acknowledge, on the other hand, that we as developing countries also, while we're growing, we want to grow responsibly, we want to grow in a sustainable manner, and we don't need to repeat the, I don't want to, I mean, the mistakes committed uh, prior to, to right now. So we're willing and moving forward. Egypt as a country, of course, is committed. Many other developing countries are. We've just updated our NDCs, showed more ambition than the previous one. We're moving to renewables. Uh, Dr. Shaker and his ministry are doing a lot of good work, excellent work, moving to renewables. Uh, but there's always going to be the need, and this is where the common but differentiated responsibility, the differentiation is key between what is expected and anticipated of developing countries compared to developed countries. Um, so finance, support by and large, but in particular finance, is essential. It is virtually impossible, I think, to continue to press on developing countries to demand of them to make more contributions without commensurate uh, uh, financial support. Um, I would find it vi very difficult for any government in the developing world uh, to prioritize uh, the, the global contribution to climate change over their own uh, development needs, their sustainable development, legitimate uh, pursuit of eliminating poverty. So it is a delicate uh, negotiation only through uh, nurturing a sense of trust and empathy. People need to listen to each other more to understand where the other side is coming from, what difficulties they would be uh, confronting, and only when we do listen to each other can we move forward uh, in the direction that we all need. But we are stressing 
Time is of the essence. We cannot afford to delay anything. It is an established scientific empirical fact that every action that should be done now, if it is not done right now, it will become that much more difficult if you delay it and multiple times more expensive. So just to wrap up on a positive note, there are positive developments. Science is helping us a lot. Um, the cost of renewables is going down. Uh, philanthropies are coming on board and being more interested. I, I just realized I was speaking, I don't know, in New York, uh, or actually in the new capital here at a meeting, and I did some research about philanthropies only to realize philanthropies who have no objective of, uh, you know, interest, uh, making profit, so on and so forth, should be driven just by the, uh, the nobility of the cause. 2% um, of global giving goes to climate. I mean, there are multiple good causes, but the climate only getting 2% is, is not a good omen, and, and they heard that message. Uh, they're willing to be part. They can unlock a lot of potential, bring in private sector, make uh, technologies available, upfront costs. Uh, they can marry, maybe carry some of that. So there are good, good things happening, but we still have these glaring gaps looking at us, and we do need to move forward on all of them. And uh, the future uh, can be bright, if we uh, commit, if we come together, if we nurture this sense of trust and ensure that we're doing the right thing and not uh, uh, continuing on this adversarial uh, pathway. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Royal, for, for this excellent presentation and uh, the lovely, nice, uh, positive ending note about things are going to be good if we work hard. Um, two of the sessions that we're going to have today are touching upon this specific issue. If we're, we're really working hard enough. Um, everybody is wondering about the climate and the, and, and the harm to all, but when it comes to paying, the, the picture changes completely. The same with COVID. We're all worried about everybody's health, but then when it comes to paying, again, it becomes an issue. There are two of our sessions that are going to deal with that. I, I want to ask you a small question before I get you off, off the hook, because we're lucky to have you. Um, uh, we're very lucky to have him in Egypt by chance. Huh? Everybody is somewhere working on the COP as well, so since you're the one representing the, the government. Egypt um, is supposedly still responsible for the COP until next year, when it is officially uh, passed on to Emirates. So what is expected from Egypt after the COP? Because many people look at the conference as if it's the end of the story. It's not at all. What is expected uh, from Egypt? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Abdel Latif. Uh, you're right, I, I was not supposed to be here. The entire delegation, Dr. Fouad, Minister Shokri, uh, our whole negotiating team is in what is dubbed as the always the last main ministerial event, which is called the pre-COP, which we chose as Egypt to host in Kinshasa. But I, I just happened to be here for, for other personal reasons, so I, I missed Kinshasa. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, Everybody thinks that COP is the end. Actually, officially, uh, we are designated COP president at the beginning of COP on the 6th of November. But uh, the practice has been that people spend the previous year, which we've been doing since Glasgow, in preparation for your own COP. So the heavy lifting and the tough work is done in the first year while you're still not COP. You're called COP designate. Uh, COP presidency designate, but the moment you assume the responsibility, it really becomes about following up on the initiatives and following up on the implementation of all of the initiatives. We've seen it before. I've been to maybe 10 COPs in succession. Many good initiatives are well-crafted on glass, glossy paper with excellent PowerPoint presentations, but ultimately to fizzle and go away right after if you do not commit to the follow-up. So this has really been our yardstick by which we measured all of our initiatives, hopefully that they all can sustain, can be implementable. They don't have to be earth-shattering initiatives, but they can be specific to a, a zone, a region, or a theme, but at least we can ensure that there's success and livability down the road. So uh, that's what we will begin doing, but again, there's the negotiation side. Right after COP, there are multiple events culminating in Bonn, which is the mid-session subsidiary body meetings. That's when uh, the current presidency, in that case it'll be Egypt, starts to take a back seat and let the incoming presidency assume the main role building up to their own COP, which is exactly what happened with uh, the UK to us and us to the UAE. Uh, but we always stress, COPs are not events. They are part of a process. It's not that 
mine is going to be the best cop in the world and that's all I care about. We have to build on, and we've been working with the UK and we're already working with the UAE and so on and so forth. This is such a global massive cause and we really have to commit to it. So in our role as pres incoming presidency and then as presidency over these two years, we'll do our utmost and then we hand the baton to the next country and we continue to play our role from the uh, party's uh, seat. Thank you very much for the, for the explanation. Uh, and, and, and thank you for us being lucky to have you and, and grab you in Egypt for whatever reason. It's my but, pleasure. But we're glad that, that you're here. And, and again, we expect uh, Her Excellency Dr. Yasmin Fouad any minute uh, joining in between her meetings. I don't know when is this going to happen uh, right now, but uh, uh, we're moving on with our program. Uh,